An antenna is any structure that can radiate electromagnetic energy, typically for communications purposes. Some common antennas are shown here, starting with this dipole antenna, a patch antenna, a Vivaldi antenna, an antenna on a cell phone, and even an antenna on an airplane. All of these types of models can be built following the same general modeling procedure. We're going to start with the simplest possible case of modeling this dipole antenna. Let's take a look at a picture of such a dipole antenna. This is what a physical antenna would look like, and let's highlight a few key points about this. First of all, we have two arms to this dipole antenna, these two vertically oriented pieces of metal. This antenna is being driven at a feed point. So there is a power supply that is bringing a signal via a transmission line, and that's going to be applying a sinusoidally time varying voltage difference across this feed gap between the two arms. The arms themselves, let's say that they are each one meter long, and we're going to be wanting to operate this dipole at a frequency such that the free space wavelength equals four times the length of these arms. So the dimensions of the arms gives us the operating wavelength of interest and the operating wavelength gives us our operating frequency. At this operating frequency, we also know that the skin depth of the metal is going to be very, very small relative to the dimensions of the antenna itself. So these are the kinds of things that you're going to want to keep track of uh, before you start any modeling. Where is the structure being fed? What is the operating wavelength? What is the operating frequency? And what is the skin depth of the materials that are going to be in your model? Once we've assembled this information, let's take a look at what a typical model would look like in a schematic point of view. This model is composed of a set of boundaries and domains. Let's start by talking about the boundaries, starting at the center with the feed boundaries. We're going to be defining a set of boundaries that approximate our feeding condition. We aren't going to be modeling any of the transmission line or any of the power supply bringing the signal to the antenna. We're going to approximate all of that via a boundary condition those feed boundaries are going to drive a signal onto the arms of the dipole. The arms of the dipole are going to be modeled via a metallic boundary condition. So the boundaries are going to be defined as the boundaries of the metal dipole arms. The antenna itself is going to radiate into the surrounding free space. And we roughly break down the surrounding free space into two regions the near field region and the far field region. The boundary between these two is somewhat fuzzy, but typically it's about a half a wavelength when it says the near field uh, region ends. In the near field region, uh, the fields have both an evanescent and a propagating component, but in the far field region, the electromagnetic fields are purely propagating. Inside of our model, we actually cannot differentiate or will not differentiate between the near field and the far field region. This will all be modeled as a single domain, but there will be an additional layer or an additional region that's called an absorbing region or a perfectly matched layer or PML domain. This PML domain or PML region is going to act as an absorber of any outgoing radiation. So it acts quite similarly to the walls of an anechoic chamber, absorbing any outgoing radiation coming from this antenna. We're going to want to compute the electromagnetic fields, the far field pattern, uh, and the antenna impedance. Let's now begin modeling inside of ComSol Multiphysics, starting by creating a new file via the model wizard where we're going to select 3D as the space dimension, and we're going to use the radio frequency electromagnetic waves frequency domain physics interface. 
We're going to select the study type to be frequency domain because we're going to be solving this model at a single frequency. You can go ahead and click done and we now have a new empty file into which we're going to start adding information. We can begin by defining a few global parameters starting with some parameters controlling the geometric dimensions, the length, and the radius of each one of the arms. Using the length, we can define the free space wavelength, and we'll call it here L0. But we can name these variables anything that we want. And based on that, we can compute the operating frequency, F0, and that is computed using the built-in constant C const, which is the speed of light. With these parameters defined, we can now move on to the geometry definition. The first thing that we'll do is we'll define one of the dipole arms using our defined parameters of radius and length. And this arm starts at the origin. We're going to offset this slightly in the Z direction using the value of radius such that it's offset slightly from the XY plane. We'll create a copy using the mirror operation. We'll take this geometric object and we're going to mirror it about the origin, about the XY plane, using this keep input objects. And in this way, we have our two dipole arms created. We'll also want to create a small cylinder of the same radius that exactly fills in the gap between the two arms. And with that, we have geometry that represents the feed and the two arms of our dipole. We now want to add a domain representing the surrounding free space as well as a perfectly matched layer that's going to absorb all of the outgoing radiation. So to that end, we'll add a sphere primitive and we'll define the radius in terms of the free space wavelength. And we can turn on uh, transparency here. And we can see that this sphere completely surrounds our geometry, our two dipole arms. We'll also, to this sphere, use the layers option to define a set of domains around the outside that's going to represent our perfectly matched layers domains. The thickness of this PML region is not terribly relevant. Uh, generally, you can make it about one-tenth or thereabouts of the radius of the, uh, of the sphere. But the, the actual thickness is, is not relevant. The software handles the thickness of the PML automatically internally. The last thing that we want to do is we're actually going to want to add a Boolean operation that takes the difference of the air sphere and the three objects in the center. So we're going to remove these three objects completely because we're not interested in modeling the electromagnetic fields within those domains. We only want to model the electromagnetic fields in the surrounding free space. So with that, the geometry creation is actually complete and we now want to define these surrounding domains as perfectly matched layer regions. And we do that via the definitions branch where we see here the option to define perfectly matched layers. And we can simply select all of these surrounding domains. And we want to make certain to define them of type spherical. And you'll notice also there is a center coordinate here. When modeling antennas, we typically want to keep everything centered around the origin for convenience. So with that, we've defined the geometry and set up the PML. We're now ready to move on to defining the materials 
we will first define the materials properties. So we can right click on the materials branch and choose to add a set of materials. We'll go to the built in library and we'll load the property air. And by default, this will be applied to all of the domains in our model. We're also going to add the aluminum property. And the aluminum property is, it's not going to be applied to any domains. It is going to be applied to a set of boundaries. And we want to apply it to all of the boundaries of our antenna. So we can again use the select box to select all of these boundaries at once. And then we want to deselect these few boundaries here in the center. So we can use the deselect box and deselect these few faces here. We can give this the name antenna boundaries. And this defines for us a selection set of these boundaries. We can also define a second explicit selection set of boundaries and select these four faces here. And these will represent our feed point. Now, the air property is defined on all the domains. The aluminum property is defined upon all of the boundaries of the antenna itself. These properties are being used by the electromagnetic waves frequency domain interface. And this interface solves the frequency domain form of Maxwell's equations on, by default, all of the domains in the model. So all eight of the perfectly matched layer regions, as well as domain number five, which is the central air domain within the model. Every physics interface has default domain conditions and default boundary conditions. The default domain condition here specifies the material property relationships. It defines the relative permeability, permittivity, and conductivity. And these are all coming from materials. In this case, there is only one materials definition, air. And we can see that we're using here a permeability and permittivity of one. The default boundary condition is perfect electric conductor, meaning that all of the exposed faces here are uh, perfectly conductive. We do want to override this by adding an impedance boundary condition, and we're going to add the impedance boundary condition to the antenna boundaries. So you can see that we've now selected all of the faces of the antenna, and we're now going to be specifying the primitivity permeability and uh, conductivity at these faces as well. And again, these properties are coming from the aluminum property. So we can see the electric conductivity is quite high and the permeability and permittivity are unity. Now, the default perfect electric conductor boundary condition uh, is being applied at all of the remaining domains. And for modeling convenience, we often like to override that so we can add a scattering boundary condition along the outside of our perfectly matched layer. This isn't strictly necessary to do, but it's often done for the purposes of modeling convenience. The scattering boundary condition also is transparent to outgoing radiation, and it's quite common to use a scattering boundary condition on the outside of a perfectly matched layer to further absorb any outgoing radiation. So we now have the impedance boundary condition on the antenna walls, the scattering boundary condition, and now we see that the perfect electric conductor boundary condition is the only surfaces that it's still applied to are these four feed point faces. So the last thing that we're going to add is a lumped port boundary condition to this feed point. And we can zoom in on that region and let's talk about how to set this up. The lumped port boundary condition is the most approximate boundary condition that we have. Uh, and by default here, it's going to specify a, a lumped port of uh, type uniform. We'll switch that over to a user defined lumped port so that we can talk about exactly what's going on here. We'll specify the height of the lumped port to be 
radius and the width to be the perimeter of this region. So 2 times pi times radius. The direction between the lumped port, that will be a vector pointing in the z direction. So what we're saying here is that this feed is exciting a voltage difference between these two faces here, between the impedance boundary conditions on either side of that lumped port. We'll also turn on a wave excitation at this boundary, and we'll leave this at its default one volt excitation. So again, this is sinusoidally varying in time at the excitation frequency that we're going to specify. So with that, we've defined uh, all of the boundary conditions and all of the feeding conditions to our model. Now, there are a few things that we're probably going to want to extract from this model, including the far field pattern. And to set that up, we're going to add a far field domain feature to our model. So we add the far field domain feature. By default, that's being applied to all domains. And we can see here that it's not applicable to the perfectly matched layers. It's simply going to consider all of the modeling domains. We could also explicitly select here the air domain. And then the far field calculation boundaries, uh, we want to select here the eight outside faces of our far field domain. So what the software will do is it will take the solution on these boundaries and use that to compute what the solution looks like in the far field. With that, we've completely defined the physics. Now, before we solve this, we do need to concern ourselves with meshing. And whenever using the RF module, you want to usually make use of the physics controlled meshing. What this will do is this will apply a mesh based upon the domain features and material properties and the operating frequency or equivalently the operating wavelength. So we can simply enter here L0 as our vacuum wavelength and we can go ahead and mesh this part. Now we can turn on transparency here to see exactly what's happened. The software has applied an element size based upon the free space wavelength. The free space wavelength, again, is, uh, is 4 meters. Uh, so we want to have an element size that's going to resolve the wave well. So we need to have at least five elements per wavelength. That will give us a good resolution of the wave. By default here, we are using a so-called second-order element, which uses a second-order polynomial to discretize the fields. Uh, so that gives us a good resolution of the fields in the surrounding free space. We can also zoom in and see that the software applies a finer mesh on the curved boundaries because obviously we want to get a better resolution of these curved faces. Also within the PML region, the software is automatically applying a so-called swept mesh because what's actually happening in the PML region is that we're absorbing all outgoing radiation so we do want to have one of these so-called swept meshes, where the mesh has these triangular prismatic elements that are aligned with the direction of absorption. So with that, we've completely defined the geometry, the materials properties, the physics, and the mesh, and we're now ready to go ahead and solve and post-process this model. Within the study branch, we see here a single step called a frequency domain study step, where we're going to enter the frequency at which we want to simulate. We could enter a range of frequencies here, but for this example, we'll just solve at a single frequency. So we just enter our frequency via our predefined parameter and go ahead and compute the solution. And now we are automatically brought to some default results plots. We'll turn off transparency here and examine and discuss the results that we're looking at. The first default plot here is a plot of the magnitude of the electric field, the norm of the electric field. And by default, this is being plotted as a slice plot in all of the domains. 
we actually don't need to look at the results within the PML region. So what we can do is we can come to data sets and we can apply a selection and make sure to only look at the results within our air domain and ignoring the results within the PML region. We're here looking at the magnitude of the electric field and we can adjust the color ranges if we would like to give us a little bit of a better visualization. We can add plots to this. So we can, for example, also make an arrow plot of the electric field. Plotting the electric field in the XY plane. And we can also duplicate this plot and also plot the magnetic field So we get a visualization of the magnetic field and the electric field. And if we want to, we can also plot the power flow. So we can get a visualization of the energy radiating away and how that intensity falls off as we go away from the antenna. And again, we can see here that we're still uh, that we're only simulating a small region about the antenna. If we did want to see more of a wave-like behavior, we could model a larger region about the antenna. Since we have the far field domain feature in our model, we also get a couple of default plots. We get a 3D far field plot showing the far field intensity pattern. And here we get this typical donut-like shape that one would expect from a dipole antenna. So this is a 3D plot of the far field. We also have a 2D plot of this far field pattern. And this looks a little bit unusual. Uh, but the key point here is that this plot is actually looking down along the Z axis. Uh, so if we uh, change the limits of uh, the scale here, uh, we can see that the far field pattern looking down uh, from the top of the antenna, we can see that that far field pattern is actually almost a perfect circle. And if we look along either the X or the Y axis rather than the Z axis, we again see this kind of double lobe pattern that we, you would expect from a dipole antenna. Within results derived values, you can extract uh, some scalar values out of this model such as the S11 dB, and a number of other quantities, such as the lumped port impedance. We can also compute the losses on our structure. So uh, since we have a finite conductivity material here, we can both plot and post-process the losses. So let's make another 3D plot group. And now let's add a surface plot of the loss. And what we're interested in here are the surface resistive losses. And we can see that uh, the surface resistive losses plotted over the dipole arms. We can change the color map around a little bit here. Now this gives us a visualization of the losses and we can also integrate over these surfaces, over the antenna boundaries, we can integrate these surface resistive losses to find out how much power is being dissipated. We can also see, again, via another global evaluation, uh, how much power is being fed in via this port. So this should give you a flavor of the kinds of post-processing that you can do in terms of extracting values and making visualizations of the results. This concludes this introductory demonstration of the dipole antenna model. Before we finish up this tutorial model, however, let's take a look at a few more complicated examples.
Within the software, when you go to the application libraries, you will have within the RF module a suite of antenna models. So for example, the model that we just worked through is this dipole antenna example right here, which you can both open or examine the PDF documentation for that contains step-by-step -step instructions to build the entire model up from scratch. You'll see a range of different example models in here that address a variety of different modeling situations.